with us today we have lecturer and trainer Mr. Chris Shermerhorn. Chris has a degree in dental technology and presently owns and manages a full service dental lab in Virginia. Chris first began working with aceto resins and other thermoplastic dental materials in 1996. He is the co-inventor of the Meyerson Hotshot Elite and co-developer of Meyerson's Duraflex Duracetal and VisiClear materials and the Meyerson FlexPress digital injection system. And without further ado, this is Chris. Yeah, hey guys, thanks a lot for attending. Um, I'm zipping through here real quick. Um, so the way that the day that this webinar is going to go, we're going to start out with our Duraflex, uh, kind of taking you step by step through processing um, from kind of start to finish. Then we're going to jump over to how to repair it, which is a big that's a big thing. And, our, and you know, with these flexible partials, something that's held us back in the past is the ability you know to repair small little accidents that happen to a partial. You know, in the past were a total remake of that partial. Now we can repair those in as quick as five or ten minutes. So we'll go over that. Um, and then once we kind of got a baseline for how to produce it by injection molding, we're going to jump over to the digital side and kind of show you how um, we can design and mill uh, these materials, uh, which is kind of an exciting thing. So the first thing that I want you guys to understand is Duraflex is not nylon and has no nylon in it. It's a newer plastic. It's a more advanced plastic. And uh, you know, because of that, um, it has a lot of nice characteristics. Basically, it doesn't stain near as bad as some other materials. Uh, grinds much, much nicer than a lot of the materials that are out there, and I think looks much nicer. And so um, Duraflex is a crystalline plastic, and essentially what that means is, without getting too involved, is you get the advantage of all those things I was just talking about. Ease of grinding, uh, doesn't absorb moisture, and therefore doesn't stain badly. And that's good for the doctor, that's good for the technician, and it's good for the patient. Here's some testing that was done to show that Duraflex has very, very limited, almost next to nothing as far as absorption of moistures, compared to nylons, which are some other materials that are out on the market. Most of them are a formulation of a nylon. But here, you know, Duraflex unlimitedly will, will float on top of the water. It will not take on the moisture and therefore um, get weight and drop. Nylons will. Nylons, you can tie this on your own. Put them in a cup of water, if they're dry already and uh, let it sit and they will uh, eventually absorb the moisture and drop to the bottom. And, and that's what happens in the mouth. It's a high moisture environment with stain bacteria, bacteria and smells and that's what's going to happen. It's going to stain, it's going to get gross over a short period of time. Duraflex will not. Um, here's also some examples of testing we had done uh, with um, different materials, uh, drinks that people will, will have in everyday life that can be staining. You can see on the top is our Duraflex um, through the different materials, red wine, black coffee, tea, uh, really did not change in any way because it doesn't take take on that moisture, uh, doesn't affect the shade. With other flexible materials that are available out there, you can see progressively got more and more dark stained because it took on those. And the staining is, is a secondary. I mean, you know, the, the big thing I worry about is the, the bacteria, um, the chemicals that they may soak it in to clean it. You know, it's taking all that in and just holding it and then can leach back out again. So, you know, Duraflex, I just want to make sure everyone understands that, you know, it is not like other materials that have been used in our industry for many, many years. This is a very, very, you know, different material. It's a newer material, more advanced material. And so that gives you a baseline to understand that we're, as I talk about this, you know, this is something, you know, relatively new. You know, that being said, it's been used in the industry for, since the early 2000s, but it's, it's newer than some other materials that have been, you know, first came in the market back in the 40s. So um, uh, let's go ahead and talk about design. So the big thing with this picture, you see these in magazines advertising flexible partials, and there's somebody squeezing them. And look, the tailpieces, they, they squeeze together. Look how flexible it is. And that's great kind of get the point across that it's a flexible material, but sometimes can't be such a great thing when it comes to function. 
And so, you know, with a free end extension on these partials, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, it has some flexibility, but not too much, because that'll cause sore spots and instability in the mouth. So a couple things. Uh, Duraflex is nice in that if you make it just a little thicker, so generally we like our major connector to be right around a millimeter thick. That's going to give you a nice amount of flexibility and not take up, you know, room in the mouth. It's going to be nice for the patient. Um, that's going to, you know, allow you to squeeze those two tail pieces together. Cool thing about Duraflex is you add, you know, five tenths, get it to a millimeter and a half to a millimeter point seven, you'll see a dramatic difference in the amount of flexibility. It'll become more rigid, still flexible, but more rigid. So if you have a freehand extension and you want it to be a little bit more stable, leaving the major connector a little bit thicker is the way to go about that. Also, don't be afraid to put an AP strap back here, all right? a little toilet bowl type major connector. Um, a little AP strap will definitely um, make that more rigid. It will um, you know, stabilize that. You'll be surprised, even keeping it at that millimeter thick, how much more stable that freehand extension will become. So you know, using the knowledge from cast partial frame side, you know, use that in your major connector design. So our models, a big thing that there's a decision to be made uh, when doing flexibles with Duraflex is whether you want to be, um, you know, blocking out or not. A lot of other companies out there with a flexible product push blocking out because those materials are very difficult to grind on compared to the Duraflex. And so they, you know, you don't have the ability to get up inside there with a burr and adjust your passive insertions and your clasps and things like that. So you got to block it out in preparation for that. Duraflex, it grinds just about like acrylic. It has a different way that it feels when you grind, but with about the same effort and the same tools. All those carbides you use on acrylic will work very nicely on this material. So um, I like the idea of not really blocking out unless you see a major undercut, major thing, something's just obvious. Other than that, go ahead and uh, process your case and then adjust it like you would an acrylic parcel, partial down to the model because you can get in there with this nice small burn and do fine adjustments. What I found with block out is, you know, sometimes you can go past the point of no return. You block out too much. Now you have food traps and all kinds of stuff, and you, can, you know you're going back to almost remaking that case. Whereas if you're adjusting it to place, you're removing just as much as you need so that it drops into place. Um, you know, but if you decide to block out, block out, duplicate your model. Once you duplicate the model, paint it with the thermoplastic model separator. This is a separator that is a, is a Meyerson product. Uh, this is for the Duraflex. This is like putting a coat uh, of paint, if you will. Um, it's a sealant for that model, but it sets. All right? and, and it is not something that rinses off or wipes off. It is like a hard plastic coating that's been placed on that model that seals all the pores so that the stone is not allowed to absorb into there and, and attach itself. So paint it with that separator. That goes on before you can start waxing the case. Again, it's not going to get washed off. You could paint it on and two years later inject the case, um, and it's not going to be deteriorated anyway. So I paint it on before I ever set up the case. When you set up the case, um, make sure that you um, are concerned with clusal space. I like to see, you know, uh, five millimeters, four to five millimeters of occlusal clearance in order to be considered for a flexible partial, and that's any flexible material. Um, the reason for that, I want to see, when that tooth goes to place, I want to see a millimeter to a millimeter and a half of space between the bottom of that tooth and the ridge. All right? We need that daylight, all right? for an instance um, here, we have this flange, all right? and we have these teeth. The material that makes it under here is all that supports that flange. Right? The material is not going to adhere to these denture teeth. They're going to be locked together with mechanical retention. So they're two separate things. And so if there's a thin little wash of material that makes it under those teeth um, and fills this, well, now this whole flange is just going to be flopping in the breeze because that material is just not thick enough to support that. Also, I'd like to see the, uh, the teeth. I'd like to see three to three and a half millimeters of that denture tooth still there. All right, um, we're going to be drilling diatoric or holes in the teeth so that they lock on nicely. And we need to have enough tooth left so that that is, you know, that we aren't weakening the tooth. So that's, you know, five millimeters, four to five millimeters is a nice thickness to be considered for a, a flexible partial. Also, you want to be concerned with ridge. If the ridge is real flat, 
Well, you know, it's like trying to ride a horse with your, you know, sitting Indian style on the back of a horse. Your legs wrapped around the back of that horse is what keeps you on that horse. All right. Um, and so it's the same thing with a ridge and with this partial. If you have flat ridges, that partial is going to be able to flop all over the place. And so it may not be, you know, you may want to jump to metal or some other choices for that are more rigid uh, for a patient that has really flat ridges. And then on the other hand, uh, for patients who have real sharp ridges, so tall but real sharp, you know, especially in the lowers where they really crest at a point. Again, this is a tooth-borne, I'm sorry, tissue-borne partial, and so all that pressure is going to be on that um, ridge at that crest, right at that point, and you're guaranteed to have some sore spots there. So you may want to move to something that's more tooth-borne and keep some pressure off that ridge, or maybe something that you can do a soft reline to to cushion that. So a couple things to consider when thinking about doing a flexible partial. Um, class design, the you know, that class can go right down to the neck of the tooth on probably 90% of the teeth uh, cases that you'll see. Now every once in a while you'll have really massive undercuts, you may have to move that clasp up the tooth a little bit. But the area that you've got to be concerned with is right here, all right, and over here, right here. Uh, this clasp, as it rolls into this partial, Right, that is going to cease to be flexible at that point. All right, it's too thick, there's too much volume of material, it is not going to flex in that area. So you have to be at or above the height of contour here and here. Then you can go into that deep undercut. So 60 to 80% of that class is going to be in that deepest undercut. But that area there, you need to mark that height of contour, that undercut of the tooth, and stay at or above it in that area. Um, biggest mistake I see people who get involved in flexibles, and even people that I've seen and been involved in flexibles for a while are making that mistake regularly, and you go up in there and you adjust and adjust and get that to finally drop, and now you have a big old um, gap in that area, and you have a massive uh, food trap. So a couple things to look out for in your design. Investing, um, the base you can use Yellowstone. I, do not, I would not use plaster, I would use Yellowstone. Sprue, um, you want this to be about three to three and a half millimeters across is the proper size for, for the Duraflex. And um, believe it or not, I want you to attach that sprue to the thin areas. All right, it sounds strange, but we want you to be in those thin areas because this material needs back pressure. I do not want, want this material to flow too freely. It opens up into a thick area like up in here, maybe up in this area where there's more volume of thickness, material will enter kind of have no guidance, flop around and trap air. When it traps that air, then you're going to have bubbles um, trapped, sometimes large, large pockets, sometimes halfway into your sprue, cut the sprue off, and now you have this tunnel, this chamber inside that saddle. So attach your sprues to the thin areas to get a better uh, uh, result. This material is going to flow. It flows beautifully. That's not the concern. Um, so attach to the thin areas. A lot of times I'll run sprues out and around attached to the facial flange. Probably 60% of the cases I do in my lab have at least one sprue that run around and comes around to the facial. I do that quite often. That helps with fit. You, you, know, you don't want so much volume in the center. Uh, sometimes you'll get a little pull into the center. Um, putting some of those sprues to the outside kind of balances everything out. And this is how not to sprue. So this is exactly not what I want to see. All right, this has a lot of resorption here, so there's a lot of space, and those sprues are ran, even ran a little lead up into that space. Um, when you sprue like that, that's what you'll see, pockets of air sometimes coming out in your sprue. So thin areas, very important. Whether you're using Duraflex or any other flexible material that's out there, find those thin areas. Another way you can get bubbles are on the undersides of the teeth. The undersides of the teeth, uh, if you don't have them clean, if you have wax, moisture, anything like that. This material is 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that's hotter than what they cook French fries in at McDonald's. It's hot stuff. When it flows in there, if it hits a drop of little water, a little residue of wax, it's going to sizzle it. When it burns it up, it's going to turn into a gas and grow into a bubble. So make sure you're a little bit more clean, a little more conscious of the cleanliness compared to what you are with dentures and things like that, your regular acrylics. The top half, I'd recommend an investing stone. Investing stones are going to be stronger than Yellowstone. They also particles settle and allow for more stability of the teeth. The material comes in there at a high rate of speed when it's injected, and when it hits those teeth, if you use a soft Yellowstone, it can mash them down into that Yellowstone a little bit. And what you'll see is you go back to your articulator, you'll have that pin open a little bit further than what, you, what you're expecting. Diatorics of the teeth. 
Um, I'd like to see one to two large diatorics rather than a bunch of little ones. Um, you know, uh, this is the only thing holding that tooth on that partial, so it's very crucial that you do nice holes in those teeth. Secondarily, this is the guy right here. This is the most important thing you can do to make sure that tooth stays. Uh, you can put nice big diatorics here, but if that material flows in and hits the bottom of that tooth, traps air in that diatoric or that hole you drilled, then the machine has to crush that air that's in there to actually force its way into that, that uh, diatoric. And sometimes it just can't do it. So you put these little teeny holes here. These are like vents. So when the material injects, hits it, it pushes air out there and actually flows through and, and locks the tooth on even better. So these guys here are very, very important. The flex press, um, we'll, we'll inject it with. Um, you can use other presses. So if you have an existing press and you're thinking about using the Duraflex, you can change the times and temperatures, and, and it should go fine. The flex press is nice because it's fully automatic. It is a set it and forget it. Load your tube, load your flask, push a button, and leave. Go to lunch. When you come back, your case is injected. It holds for the specified time, uses compressed air to inject, and boom, you have a case done. Really nice. It heats the flask as well as the material, melts the material, so you get just a really nice, nice, consistent uh, injection. When you break it out, I use no separator on the upper half of my flask. Um, the moisture that's involved in some separators, things like that, it's just not worth it. It comes out really clean, and we're going to be grinding and polishing that surface anyways. You can see the underside comes out beautifully shiny from that separator, almost like it's polished. And that's what you want, because that's going to help it to avoid any surface staining, uh, discomfort to the patient, anything like that. Fitting to the model, um, the fits are great. I've used uh, flexible partial, you know, different flexible partial materials from mid '90s, and um, I've, I've seen the most consistent fits with the Duraflex. Um, I really, really like what I get with with fit. Um, the translucency of it really allows for. Uh, it to melt into the mouth, to chameleonize itself to the mouth, uh, really is probably the most aesthetic material for a partial that I've seen. You can see here, it's hard to tell where the clasp starts and stops. You can decide to fatten the clasp, make it a little more bellied out, and you can make it not as broad, not as wing-like. But sometimes food can get caught or whatever. But you know you can affect this material because as you get a little belly, again you add a little thickness, it becomes more rigid. You can design it that way, or you can design it broad and make it thinner to the tooth. So you can, you know, with this material, one thing that's nice is you can affect your design that way. Here's a case, um, just as a, an example of how it looks in the mouth. You can see many teeth missing. Um, the thing I like about this picture is. It's hard to tell where the flange even starts and stops. Um, it really chameleon. You can see the patient has pale gums, and the material actually will not only go up for darker gums, you know, absorb that color and darken itself, but it'll even lighten itself to match to, um, you know, to, to lighter, more pale gums. Um, you can see over here. Here's a clasp. Would have liked to maybe take that point off ever so slightly, but because this material has a lot more translucency than other materials in the market, even if you make slight mistakes or things aren't absolutely perfect, it blends in. It's actually picking up the tooth color. And even though it has a pink tint to it, actually blending itself in. So it's not this stark bubblegummy pink. It's a nice translucent pink. And here's a patient smile. So it really, really works nice. You do have to be careful the next to the teeth because it is translucent when you do your setup. You know, only allow those teeth to drop a millimeter or two into that base. You know, if you have space on one central um, to the gum tissue and not on the other, don't leave one neck going four millimeters up inside the denture base and the other one at two. You'll you'll see that through. So you have to be consistent when you do your setup to make sure the necks of those teeth are all consistent. Okay, I'm talking real fast. Got a lot of information to go through, um, but we're we're looking on target. Um, so let's jump. Okay, we. You now see how to make up one of these partials. Um, now let's show you how to repair um, using the hot shot gun. Hot shot gun is a mini injector, right? This is just like or very similar to the flex press in that it extrudes material or injects material, but it's just handheld. Um, it allows you to do, you know, the, the flex press can do everything. It can do repairs, it can do everything, uh, injections, but everything has to be invested and it's very time consuming. The, 
Hotshot allows you to do a lot, a lot of smaller things, but real fast. And we'll kind of show you what that is. So here we have a partial. All right, um, the tooth has come off, or we're adding a tooth, whatever the situation might be. Um, we wax the tooth in place, and we do a putty matrix. All right, we're going to heat the model in a toaster oven at, a, at about 200, 200, not 250 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And we load up our gun with material, and it's melting our material. It's only going to take about four minutes to melt the material. Once the timer goes off, we'll remove our partial out of the oven, and we'll use this torch here. This is from Blazer. Um, this is model number SI100. This is a butane torch. It is not blowing a flame out. It just blows out hot air. All right. So I'm going to bring this torch down to the partial, and I'm going to get it as close as I can. I'm going to go 2001, 2002, and then I'm going to bring the nozzle of the gun is in my right hand, and I'm going to inject a blob on there. All right, just a blob into that space. I'm going to set the torch down, set the gun down, and then I'm going to take my putty that has my tooth packet into it with a little dab of glue, and I'm going to smash it down into place. This is a lot like doing an acrylic repair at this point all right, um, with a putty matrix. Instead of smashing acrylic uh, inside there, it's a blob of molten plastic. All right, and I would say uh, let's use protective gloves. Uh, <laughs> Well, I'm a little uh, gutsy, and, and that's fine, but uh, we probably want safety first. Um, aluminum foil. Aluminum foil is your best friend when it comes to working with these flexibles. The, the, the um, Duraflex will not stick to the, the, the aluminum foil. Um, so you can, like, wrap it around your finger, and whenever you have this blob of material oozing out, I take that foil and I smash it. There I am with my safety. Um, that would not be fun if you use that with your bare hand. So you're going to smash that, kind of roll your finger. Um, just to, it's, what I found is little bubbles, you know, as you smash it, the, it's forcing air out. And those bubbles will sit right on the lingual of the tooth in that area. So if you come in with that foil, kind of roll that, it just kind of forces that little bit of air that may be there. Sometimes it would be there, sometimes it wouldn't. But I found that it's never there um, if you use your foil and, and roll that. Um, you can do that to repair. You get a little, say, a little bit of stone in the major connector. Um, you know, you can uh, clean out the stone, inject a little blob there with your gun, take your foil, roll it over that, uh, take it off, finish it, and boom, you know, it's done. Um, same thing with the clasp. I had one time, uh, one of my technicians was, you know, beginning, and uh, she had polished my clasp, just a flat spot in it. She just whacked the heck out of it. And it was, you know, the end of it was flopping the breeze. And so all I did was add a little wax to where she had flattened off that, the outside of that clasp, add a little wax so that it was back to the right contour, did a putty matrix of it. I then came in with the torch, heated it, 1001, 1002, came in with the gun, injected a little blob on there, came with my putty matrix, smashed it out, took it off, cleaned it up, gave it back to her, you know, 10, 15 minutes later, and she's polishing it again. So it's a nice thing to know you have that opportunity with these materials. Uh, you know, I know when I first started back in the 90s, you whack a clasp like that, you're doing one of two things. You're remaking it or you're trying to contour that clasp and, you know, make it into more of a finger clasp or something to get that case out the door. Um, now you don't have to compromise. You don't have to do that. You can add teeth on. You can add clasps. You can, you know, fix uh, – uh, craze lines. You could fix a short injection, which kind of never happens with Duraflex, but because uh, that material is super fluid when it's melted. That's a nice thing about it as well, being a crystalline plastic, is it flows beautifully. So here's our, after we've kind of rolled that in, uh, here's another repair, adding a tooth. Um, this tooth moved during injection. So that can happen. You don't get the, ta the tooth tacked down just quite right. Uh, material flows in there, moves the tooth. Well, that might be a total remake, uh, you know, if it wasn't Duraflex or if it was back before we knew the, the advantages of being able to use a hot shot gun. But in this case, you wax the tooth back into place or a new tooth, do your putty matrix, smash it down using the same process you saw. Take the torch in your left hand, put it right down on there as close as you can get without touching it, 1,001, 1,002. Inject a blob, more than what you expect you need. Because when you smash that putty, you want it to ooze, because that means it's flowing into the diatoric. It's also flowing into the finer details. Um, you're always going to have this flash, 
and that's okay. It trims off, doesn't stick to the teeth. It will trim off just fine. And there's a repair. No line of demarcation, no real evidence that it was done. This is almost as good as brand new. Uh, basically is as good as brand new. You know, when we do acrylic repairs, you're kind of, you know, doing cold cure or a, a self-cure to a new denture or something like that. And, you know, it's not a good feeling. It, you know, you feel like you're putting something lesser to something brand new. With this, I mean, it, it's not a the weaker material, it's the same material, and it's bonded on, melted to it 100%. All right, cool. So we're going to shift gears a little bit. Um, so we have, you know, we kind of gone through the traditional way of processing this. Now the Duraflex and VisiClear, and so let me make this clear, the VisiClear that I'll show you. Um, VisiClear is the same material as Duraflex, just doesn't have any pink in it. So anything that I talked about previously with repairing, with injecting, everything, it's the same as VisiClear because it is the same material, same temperature, same process. Everything is exactly, exactly the same. So now we have Duraflex in a puck form and we have VisiClear in a puck form that can be milled. So I'm going to minimize this and I have a case sitting here that we can bring up. So. Um, there's two different ways that are kind of exciting that you can do. Now, we can actually make a framework. So this is a framework just like a metal frame that you're going to apply acrylic and denture teeth to uh, in the future. Uh, not the future, but you know, just like a metal frame, just not metal, uh, either VisiClear or tissue-colored Duraflex. But another thing that's kind of cool that's come out is actually um, doing um, kind of a base plate with clasps. All right, and um, you can have it 3D printed, set your teeth on it. That can go to the doctor, and the doctor can uh, get a really good feel for the, if the fit's good. Um, when he does a try and because it'll have clasps on it, he'll actually be able to securely put it in place and do that try in And so and that's kind of a cool, you know, thing that's going on. So. This is Exacad software. With Exacad, you actually have the ability to, um, you know, it's going to show you your undercuts. And so, um, with that, um, I'll kind of show you. Give me a second. Of course, the computer is going to work slow at this point. All right. So um, with our smudge, we can take away, I like to make my tool big because we're not dealing with chrome where we have a very precise small area we kind of want to uh, uncover at the very tip of the clasp. Again, 68% of our clasp is going to be in the undercut. And so we can uncover that. Um, as you can see, we go from blue into kind of a green and, and then it'll kind of go into a yellow and then into an orange and a red. At the very tip of the clasp, red's iffy. I would try to stay away from reds, try to stay into the oranges and yellows, greens and blues. Um, um, at, you know, at the tip it can handle probably the oranges and maybe into red at the very tip. At the base of the clasp in this area, I'd want to stay into the most into the yellows, but may, you know, greens and yellows would be best. And then back in here, again, we want to stay at or above the height of contour, so I don't touch it at all. I leave it totally blocked out. All right. Same thing here. That area here, I'm not touching. All right. I'm going to leave that totally blocked out, but we're going to come down in here and we're going to take away and get into some of our undercut. Again, you don't have to be, just like whenever you're doing flexibles in, in our lab, you don't have to be so precise because we do have some movement to it. We can go ahead and smooth that. All right, and then same thing here. Let's uncover that. We're going to get a little more undercut here into the greens, which is good. All right, and then I'm going to leave this here. All right, here's our tissue, right? And so this has a nice rounded, if you look from the side, tissue. That's a concern as well. So because we're going to do more of a wing-type clasp in this instance, I'm going to take away a little bit here. But not a crazy amount, because again, we're 
you know, as this partial goes to place, we won't be scraping tissue and then raking our partial clasp across the patient's tissue. That's really where they're going to get some pain. And again, this, again, Duraflex grinds beautifully, so I'd rather you remove a little bit, have less block out, and relieve it after the fact, then take away too much, block out too much, and now it's just not working. So after we um, adjust, now it's going to have us mark our major connector. So what I'm going to do now, this again, this is not the framework. This is going to be making our base plate with clasps. So I'm going to go along, and I'm going to do this really quickly, not super accurate, just so time savings, but you want to mark all of your kind of where you want that partial to be. And it's asking me to mark my major connector, but I'm actually going to make the clasps and everything because this is faster for this uh, particular way we're going about it. Again, I'm not going to do everything pretty. All right, we'll go around and get our clasp. Again, we don't want to rake across that tissue. That's one cool thing that's nice about the software is it tells us where our undercuts are. And that's something for an experienced technician they can do, but for an inexperienced, the computer's doing it for them. So you can train somebody much faster. All right, so there's our major connector. You can go back and we can do a little adjustments. You know, after the fact, we can kind of look and really Cling. Again, hey, I want to get into the undercut a little bit there. It's okay. It's not going to create a, you know, we get a little goof here. All right, so all right, make everything look like a class. All right, so then I'm going to, go to our settings. All right, I want to make everything smooth, and our, made, our um, uh, mesh thickness and everything, I'll show you that later. We don't have to worry about that. I want to jump to my base thickness, and I like to do it about 2.2. This is pretty broad, so 2 point, uh, one point, sorry, 1 1.2 is going to be fine. If it was thinner, like say we had come up near, I might thicken it up a little bit, but 1.2 allows for some material to be taken away during finishing and or um, doing, uh, you know, our polishing is going to take away some material, things like that. And so our computer is going to create our base. All right, and there it is. So now we would take this and 3D print it, and we can take that. I'll we'll have to clean some of these goobs up, but that's really easy. Um, and then as you go along, draw a clasp. Don't need to. It's going to ask me to skip. Yeah. And so I'll just keep going through. Um, you can add with your cone. You can take your cone and put it right to the thickness that you have or close to it, and then you can add some of these areas that got gooed up and then smooth them later. Oh, I want to extend this. You can add, you know, down. You can do all these things um, um, to adapt and change. And then this gets 3D printed, and when it comes back, you set your teeth on here and it goes for trying. Now, these clasps, you may have to relieve them a little bit so they're a little bit more passive than your final will be because it's not a flexible or as flexible as a Duraflex, so it won't handle that as well. Um, uh, and that's something that you can do. And then once it comes back and the doctor says everything's great, all you do is pour a model inside of this, because of course it's going to fit beautifully. So you just put a model inside of it, and um, once the model's inside, um, you... Uh, <coughs> um, uh, pour the model inside, invest it, inject it, and then boom, it's uh, out the door. So you don't have to, you know, it saves you doing the extra models, everything like that. So uh, let me see here. So I'm going to start again and design a, give me a quick sec. So now, <clears throat> a little different, we're going to do a framework. So we're going to mark our major connect. This time I'm going to be concerned because I want to create a framework, all right, mesh. Again, I'm going to do this a little sloppy for the saving us time so you get the gist. 
So I'm making space for my mesh and creating my major connector. Now I'll just go straight across. All right. And then, oh, one sec. And I got to make my mesh. I'm getting so quick, I'm forgetting stuff. All right, you always want to overextend past the where you marked your major connector. Clean that up a little. Um, everything, if you're going to start to design these, when I first started designing my um, partials, it was taking me a while. And I was like, wow, this is not fast, and I, I don't know if this makes sense. And believe me, just like everything in our industry, as you do it more, as you get more uh, proficient at it, it's surprising how much faster you become at everything, even digital. <clears throat> and so there's our mesh. I like to... Um, so we're going to go to our settings. This is going to first difference here. So our mesh thickness is 0.75. I like to take that up to about you know nine or so. Our relief, that's the space underneath the mesh. I like to take that up again to about eight or nine, depending on how much it cools the room you have, because we want more thickness. This is a flexible um, as opposed to a metal, and so we want a nice butt joint between our acrylic and our base. Uh, and so more block underneath allows for more of a butt joint there. Our base thickness, again, we want to take it up to about 1.1, 1.2, somewhere in that range. So we've thickened up our actual mesh, so the acrylic and it are going to be locked together nicely. We've also created more space underneath, and we've taken our major connector to 1.2, and we've made it smooth. One thing I also like to do is go ahead and make my hole a good bit bigger. All right, it just allows for um, kind of, again, I want thickness of material. There are certain areas of this partial I want to be thick and some I don't. And so, you know, this allows for more thickness, more volume of material. Much, not a bunch of little holes, but a, uh, some bigger ones. Um, you could um, also have marked tissue stops in here. You can also put one off the back, which is what I'm going to do. Um, more tissue stops than what you expect you need. Um, you know, I, I like keeping things stable. When you press pack or you inject or whatever it might be, you're putting a lot of pressure um, on the partial frame. And metal, of course, it, you know, it's not likely to bend or move or whatever. This can move. It can flex. And if you don't have nice tissue stops, that can affect um, the fit of it, you know, when it comes out. And so here's our mesh and our major connector. Everything's good. Again, I would clean all this up at this point. Now it's asking us to draw our clasps. So I'm going to draw my clasps on here. Going along. Double click. Same thing here. I'm going to take it down close to the tissue, but not right on it yet. Double click. <clears throat> All right, so as a choice, I'll either do half round, which is a little thicker than a regular metal class, or they actually have a solve uh, choice. So if you do the half round and then you click on the class, all right, and then bring up your settings, I'm going to take up the base of it a little bit and the middle just a bit. All right, and so for like a premolar like this, that's going to be pretty good to start with. All right, I'm going to hit apply. Then when we jump to the molar, I'm going to make it just a little heavier. All right, give me something to work with. And that's going to translate. Each setting you've made translates to the last. So we can make this small since it's a pre-more. And you can just kind of visually see where you're at. Um, this is the size you want. And then we'll hit apply. So then when I go next, it's going to have me fill with the cone. Um, I'm going to take that thickness down a little. 
Now what I'm going to do is make it more my wing type design. All right, so I'm going to extend because the software doesn't really have the option for these types of clasps yet. All right, and we're going to extend over. All right, same thing I'll do with each one of these, just running down, being conscious of the undercut that the that the software has already already shown me. Again, we aren't designing metal clasps here. We're designing flexible partial clasps. And then it's going to ask for our finish line, so I'll do that real quick. The finish line also, I want to make sure that I get a nice undercut as well as a nice um, you know, size to it. So I always choose, the finish line one has a little belly on it. Um, I can't really see, but it has a little belly. I like finish line number two, which is more flat. All right, I kind of like this one. It's a little low profile. has a little undercut to it. This one's sticking out a little too much, so I'm going to angle it so I get a little bit more of an undercut to it. And, and it's less bulky coming out this way. And so the position's eh, pretty decent. So we'll apply. So there's our finish lines. And then at that point, it's going to ask me to edit. And so you can go along and you can smooth things. You know, again, this is done quickly. But you can kind of see so you can smooth what's there. You could take away. And then re-smooth. We can take and make our... Um, tool a little bigger and go along and the stuff we added. And again, all right, zirconia, you want it to be absolutely perfect. All right. Um, with uh, metals, you want it to be, you don't have to grind on this stuff. This stuff grinds beautifully. So don't get caught up in making everything digitally perfect. Um, when it comes out of the mill, take, you know, don't spend 10 minutes uh, smoothing everything on here when it would take you 30 seconds to do it in your hand outside of the mill. Now, I'm talking to all different labs I know out there, and some of them, they're going to say, no, we need to do everything perfect on the digital because we, you know, we don't do much in our hands. And that's fine. You know, again, cool thing about this is it allows you to adjust for the situation that you know you have in your lab. All right. Um, you know, Every lab is different, and so hopefully you know with this, it gives you a lot of different options. You know, you may say, well, look, we aren't going to do any of these frameworks, but hey, that base plate concept with the class, that's really pretty cool. We can 3D print those in a second. Um, whenever you do these finish lines, I always get this big old belly up here. And so what I've found is if you make your tool real big, and then you just kind of hit the edge of that, if it's small, it's going to take a big old chunk off, but if you just kind of go along there and just kind of click at it, it'll shrink it down for you and make it make sense. And so you can go along and, you know, clean everything up from that point. So you should be able to design, and if you wanted to uh, uh, – shoot, I can't get to my tool over here because of the bar. I don't know that I can move that bar. There we go. And so do you do your tissue stop? Back here you can kind of have it come off the back side and just fill that in and, and that'll be a tissue stop. If you wanted to make one on you, you could have um, uh, um, whenever you did your block out, you know, for your mesh, when you know, when I click, 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 clicked around here, you could have made a little square in there. But you could also go, oh I forgot, let me make a bigger tissue stop. You can actually go in and take away your your uh, block out and make a, a little tissue stop there. And then uh, when you come back, you can just fill in the, the little gap there. So the nice thing about the software, it does allow you to kind of go back and, because believe me, when you first get into this, you're going to sit there and you're going to design something, go, oh, I forgot this or I forgot that. And most of the softwares, whether it's Tree Shape or this, allows you to kind of go back and, and finalize things. So. 
All right, great. So we're at 11.45. Um, what I'm going to do now, um, if anybody has any questions, um, you can post them to the little question board. If you, I guess you guys have that. I don't know what exactly you're saying, but the um, you can type those in and then I can read those and answer them. Don't see anything here now. Oh, here we go. So it says, uh, <clears throat> hold on. It says, what is the ideal tis tissue structure for this flexible to work without causing food traps? So I'm guessing that question, what they're referring to is, you know, bony tissue as opposed to soft, squishy tissue. Um, I think that really depends. I mean, it's tricky. Uh, as a lab, we have a hard model, so it's hard to know what is soft, squishy tissue and what's bony tissue. I do not put any bead lines on my um, uh, flexibles because we don't know what's bony and what's squishy. Metal, you know, it doesn't matter. It smashes bony stuff out of the way. We've all seen that when we get stuff back for repairs and, and everything. But with flexibles, they're going to flex around the bony stuff, and you could get a, a bad fit, an odd fit. So um, with uh, uh, the bony stuff, um, you know, with, with these, you can get a little more movement. It's tissue supported if it's squishy. But usually you have some bony areas. So use your landmarks. On a lower, find that retromolar pad. Um, on the upper, hamular notch, um, some of those areas. If you have doubts, make that major connector broader. You can even do full pallet major connector if you really want some stability. So it's a little bit of a tough question to answer as far as that's concerned. But we would, you know, the bony stuff, you know, what we found, you know, a lot of people worry, oh, it's tissue supported. You're going to smash that tissue as the patient chews, going to beat that tissue down. The problem with that is um, what we're finding is bone is actually staying up to support the partial because it has something there. Um, so we're seeing less and less with flexibles a uh, need to do relines. Uh, with chrome, it's resting on the teeth. There's no pressure on the ridge. The ridge says, okay, bye. I'm getting out of here. I'm going to shrink back. And we do realigns. With flexibles, we're finding that the bone is actually saying, oh, there's something here I need to support. Let me stay here and do that. Um, there's no official studies on that, but uh, you know that's what we're finding right now. I have another question. What mill do you recommend? Um, I've used several, but the one thing that I am finding is uh, a nice high um, rate of speed. Um, you know, uh, some of the slower mills, we're working on some milling strategies as far as the spindle speed. Um, we're working on some milling strategies to help with that. Um, the Rollins, I think they're like 40,000 RPM, and they're pretty slow to mill a framework or something like that. We're looking at like, you know, two and a half, three, even three and a half hours. Some of the preliminary, and this is preliminary, um, tests we're doing with CAP is working on this with us. Um, we're now gotten some Rollins uh, doing some like hour and a half to two hour milling jobs, which is great. That's a, an acceptable time. I have a VHF mill, which has a high, high rate um, spindle speed. Um, I know some of the Ar Armand Garbach uh, mills have a pretty good milling speed, and that makes a big difference. With any, without any change to my mill, um, most of my frames are anywhere from an hour and 20 minutes to two hours. It's very rare that I go over two hours if it's a big case, maybe, but that's it. So, um, you know, as far as recommending, and I would recommend also a puck changer if you can afford it. Um, usually they're ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 more. But when you're mill, if you're really going to get into milling some of these removables, they're in there, and it's nice to let it do it at night. And so you can have those materials coming in and out. Uh, so having the puck changer is something to really consider. When I considered it, you know, I felt like there would be a certain point where I'd have to buy another mill. And um, with a puck changer, that drastically changes that point to where you have to consider buying, buying another mill. So the $10,000, $15,000 can be worth it.
Yeah, so someone just made the comment about it taking about two hours, and we're hoping to get all those mill speeds down. Again, everything in our industry is, you know, when it comes to milling is based off of, of um, doing Crown Bridge, all right? And so with Crown Bridge, we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, five-tenths of a millimeter tools, burrs, um, doing fine margins and all this stuff. And when it comes to removable, we don't need that preciseness, all right? And, you know, we need it to be accurate. But we aren't dealing with microscopic margins, right? We're dealing with just a nice fit. And so we can um, use larger tools. We can, uh, you know, uh, the outside of the partial, you're going to have to polish. This part of the partial, you're going to have to polish that. It comes out of the mill looking nice and shiny, but eventually after you probably apply acrylic into it, you're going to have to polish that. So why do we need it to come out glossy? Use a larger burr, let it go across the surface, and then we can polish it ourselves. And that all is going to save time. And that's the kind of things that we're working on is kind of changing our industry um, you know, when it comes to milling so that we have more, uh, um, uh, you know, more time savings and we still get a nice accurate uh, mill. So I'm reading right now. Um, so this one says, well, this, give me a sec. It's giving me a um, really small little thing to read these questions. What do we use to polish? Um, believe it or not, the uh, Duraflex will polish pretty decent with pumice, but there is a polishing kit. Um, it's a Meyerson product that's made for the Duraflex, and it's um, comes with four different bristle brushes. They're, the, the fingers on those bristle brushes are rubber, and they're embedded with an abrasive. So it's pretty cool. There's a yellow, red, and a blue, and a green. They're colored. And um, they do a really nice job at polishing the material. You can sit at your desk and do it. The one thing I would recommend is a fully adjustable lathe. There's a Fordham I know makes one that I use. And it has a dial on it. It's like a big handpiece motor. You, do, you know, adjust that dial and you can set it for whatever speed. There's not a high and a low. What I found with red wing or boulder lays is low is a little too slow to be efficient, but works, but it's a little slow. And high is just too high. It just wants to wipe everything out if you're not careful. So there's a speed in between those two to where that polishing kit works nice. And you can ask your um, um, Zon rep. They sell them, and they're fairly inexpensive. I know they're around $200, so they're not a crazy price. Um, so that polishing kit um, works beautifully, and you can use it on, you know, all your flexibles. Um, it'll work on other companies' brands. Um, some of them you have to rubber wheel first and then use it, but you know, it's not like it'll it'll go to waste as far as that's concerned. So when asked about pricing, don't really um, n know about that um, uh, yet. Um, the you can kind of ask your rep to get a more accurate idea, but as far as tubes are concerned for injecting, you're looking at right around six to seven dollars per injection for those tubes. So that's pretty competitive with most you know other flexibles that are out there. When it comes to the milling pucks, um, that one they're going to be released um, at the beginning of next year uh, officially, and so the pricing is um, I don't know. You'll have to wait for that and. and um, talk about that. We'll talk about that once it's released. You can talk to your reps about it and stuff. So this appliance that's up on the screen, someone asked, what are, what are you, what will I be milling this out of? Because I made more of a wing type design, all right, that's going to be the Duraflex um, and or VisiClear. All right, um, we need that more of a wing type design. I could have fattened these up a little bit and left them more traditionally designed. Um, you can do that. Play around with it. Um, you ask your doctors to give you feedback. Um, what I found is, is the broader you go, the thinner you can go, and that tends to be better. Even the thinner in here you can go, which means you can move that tooth up next to that, uh, your denture tooth up next to that uh, adjacent tooth much easier. So we answer the pause. Um, so someone asked about posting to YouTube. Meyerson is starting a uh, video library you know, where we already have one up on repairing. So a lot of the pictures that you saw on adding a tooth, I uh, show adding a clasp, which is very much the same process. We're going to do one on fixing 
uh, fractures, things like that. So you can go onto Meyerson's YouTube channel, um, and they will, you know, you'll be able to see all those. And we're trying to put out a few a month, so we'll really build that library up, um, you know, quickly. Um, what will we be listed as? Um, you'll have to talk. Um, you can call Meyerson. Um, if you look up Meyerson, Duraflex, put all those keywords in the search, it'll pop up. And then once you find one of the Meyerson videos, you can uh, subscribe to that. Okay. All right, that looks like that's all the questions, and we're getting close to uh, um, out of time anyway. Let me make sure. Okay, so someone asked how many frameworks get a puck. So um, I've gotten three. That's rare. Uh, they're kind of smallish. I mean, they're normal size, but you can finagle them in there and get three. But definitely solid two um, you can get out of a puck. And uh, the cost, you know, again, is up in the air a little bit, but uh, I think you'll find that it's not going to be too crazy. Um, I have heard rumblings of what the price of those pucks is going to be, and I can't really comment on it, but I will tell you that I don't think you'll be upset, especially when it comes to some other materials that are out there to do frameworks with um, that are kind of ridiculously priced. I think uh, you'll be pleasantly surprised at the final decision on pricing, even though you know, it's a little bit of a tease. I can't give you an exact on that. So um, yeah. All right. Um, so I'm thinking, thinking that's all the questions. Ah, do you have a picture of a frame? I'm glad somebody asked that. I do have a picture of the frame. I'm so glad someone said that. So here's VisiClear in the mouth. Whoever asked that question, thank you a lot, because I <laughs> that was really timely, because I am. Uh... So here's a VisiClear in the mouth. You can see how it's picking up the pink. You can really see how it blends in. Here's a VisiClear framework. You can see it has a little bit of a haze to it. Um, that's actually very important. Optically crystal clear, there's a few frame materials out there that are optically crystal clear, and that's a real problem um, in the mouth. It shows shadows as the clasp roll into acrylic. They look like a black cave. Patients say, hey, there's something on my tooth there, and I try to clean it off, and then I take it out, there's nothing there, and it's, they're just seeing the shadow. With the VisiClear, it has a little bit of a haze to it, which actually absorbs color. It's what, you know, color comes in. You can see on this blue model, it's basically turned blue. So light comes in, bounces back, and it traps it. And so it allows for, um, for it to chameleonize itself. You know, Duraflex is the same way. It, it already starts with a slight pink tint, tint to it, um, or a heavy pink tint, depending on the shade, because there is multiple shades of the Duraflex that are available. Um, but with the VisiClear, you can see that um, once it drops into the mouth, whether it's on a blue model or in a mouth and the saliva surrounds everything. I mean, I the other day um, was quality controlling in, in the morning, and uh, I went and looked at the billing, and it just said bite block. And, um, you know, there was a bite block on a base plate in there. A lot of times when we do frame try-ins, we opt to do the base plate, bite block on a base plate rather than the frame, just in case the frame's interfering with the bite somewhere that we don't realize when they do the the bite, it, it's, it won't affect it. Um, and I looked, and I was like, there's a clear frame here. So I took it into my the office manager, and I was like, hey, there's a clear frame here. Why didn't you charge for it? She's like, I had no idea. It was on the model, and she couldn't even, she didn't even see it um, because it was blending in the model. So it really blends in nicely uh, with uh, the material. So um, that is about it for time. Uh, I really, really appreciate you guys taking time out of your day to look at this stuff. If you have any questions um, for me, you're more than welcome to uh, contact your rep, uh, contact Meyerson, and uh, I do I answer questions. I do quality control uh, or, or technical support. I'm sorry for Meyerson. So um, yeah, I have no problem talking to you on the phone and uh, answering any questions you might have.